Hello, and welcome to the Dark Ages Podcast. This is Episode 5, Five Kings and a Reckoning. I'm sure you've noticed that the pace of events slowed down considerably in the last two episodes as I tried to give a good account of Alaric's career. In this episode, it's time to speed things up again and cover some ground, because Alaric was dead. After sacking Rome and ensuring his place in history, Alaric had taken his Visigoths south to attempt to cross over to Sicily, but was stopped in his tracks by the Goth congenital incompetence with boats. I don't really believe in national traits, but I do believe in national habits. And the history of Goths is the story of a people who just kept meaning to learn to sail and never got around to it. I already told the story of the burial in the riverbed. The Roman chronicles refer to a fabulous treasure that he had been buried with, and that has motivated treasure hunters ever since. But the Bucento is a very short river, and if anything was going to turn up, I feel like it would have by now. So, moving on. Alaric was succeeded by his brother-in-law, Atolf. We met Atolf, if you remember, being intercepted and defeated, but not really, by Olympias during the siege of Rome. I have absolutely no idea why, but in the movie in my head, Atolf is played by Sam Rockwell. Uh. We know nothing about Atolf before he answered Alaric's call for reinforcements, and came down from Pannonia. Later incidents will suggest that he was more involved in the intertribal rivalries than his brother, which we will get to. Atoll continued to move around Italy after the death of his brother, raiding for provisions and still attempting to push Ravenna to come to some kind of agreement. But despite having the emperor's sister still in tow, along with the deposed pretender Priscus Attalus, two years went by with nothing accomplished. The new big man in Ravenna, who had stepped into the role vacated by Stilicho and Olympias and Jovius, was a man who would prove to finally have some staying power, by the name of Constantius. This is going to be a problem, since we will have three different men with variations of that name all running around together at the same time, at various points in this episode. So I'm going to call this one Constantius of Italy. That is not, I repeat, not, an official name or one that you will find in any book about the period, especially since he was actually born in Moesia. It's just a little verbal cue for me to remind you, and me, of where this one's loyalties and priorities are. Constantius was more competent and loyal to Honorius than his predecessors, and would be elevated eventually to co-emperor status. I'll introduce the other guys as we come to them. Constantius, by the way, is played by Michael Gambon in our movie, so maybe that will help. In 411, Constantius' headaches were many and varied. The wave of Germanic invaders across the Rhine was followed by another wave, this one made up of Vandals, Alans, and Suevi. The failure of the imperial center to protect the territories had given rise to a new usurper called Constantine, who was acclaimed emperor by the legions in Britannia, and then set sail to try and control the situation in Gaul. This Constantine is known as Constantine III, often with quotes around that number, since his status was always a little dicey. Stilicho had sent Sarus the Goth to evict him, but was forced to retreat back to Italy. In 408, what with all the rolling crises in Italy, Honorius was forced to acknowledge Constantine as co-emperor, with authority in Gaul, Hispania, and theoretically Britannia, but everyone knew that it couldn't last. I feel like I'm rehashing a lot of material that might already be familiar if you are a fan of the History of Rome podcast or of Roman history in general, and that's because I am. But it's bound up with the history of the Visigoths, and when we go back to talk about Huns and Vandals and Franks, all the groundwork will have been done for us so we can maybe move a little quicker through those episodes. Constantine III did his best, but was soon undone by his generals, as so many emperors had been. His general in Spain revolted against him and drove Constantine's son, named Constance, out. Meanwhile, the Vandals and Suevi and Alans took advantage of the chaos to push into Spain themselves. Hispania was thus effectively lost to any kind of Roman control. Another usurper named Jovinus appeared in the north of Gaul then as well. Constantine admitted defeat and agreed to enter a monastery. That did him little good as he and his son were captured by Constantius' men and executed as soon as they had gotten into Italy. So you're going to ask me what all of this has to do with the Visigoths, right? 
Go ahead, ask me. Thanks. What this has to do with the Visigoths is that old Priscus Attalus, still tagging along, thought he spied an opportunity. He couldn't go back to his old life among the Italian nobility, so he was obliged to help Atolf and the Visigoths find a stable spot. He advised Atolf to give up the pointless ravaging of Italy and head north and offer support to Jovinus. Atolf agreed, and the Visigoths crossed into Gaul in 412. Jovinus was happy to have their support. His grip on Gaul was far from secure. He didn't fully control the Mediterranean coast. The Franks in the northeast served him as federates but could turn on him at any moment, and it's possible that the aristocrats of the northwest were also aloof. But the alliance was short-lived. Sarus, you'll remember him, had fallen out with Honorius and decided that he would also head north and join Jovinus. Atoll's reaction, when he heard, was not on your Nelly, and according to Olympiodorus, took 10,000 men to intercept Cyrus in the mountains. That may have been overkill, as Cyrus was traveling with just 28 companions. Cyrus fought bravely, though, and inflicted disproportionate losses on Atoll's men before he was finally captured and later killed. The Goths were clearly not so Romanized that they would give up on blood feuds and that tradition would continue to be strong among the Germanic kingdoms that succeeded the empire for centuries to come. Jovinus was aghast at the violence of Atoll's reaction, and turned on Attalus for bringing such a destabilizing force into his domains. Atolf and Jovinus argued over the Visigoths placing Gaul, with Atolf apparently under the impression that he was to have a leading role, and Jovinus seeing them as just another federate force to be used at his discretion. Before long, Atolf broke with Jovinus, arrested him and his brothers, and sent them all back to the Romans. They were executed at Narbonne, and their heads were sent back to Ravenna. Constantius thanked them, and agreed to provide a supply of grain to the Visigoths, while Roman control was being reasserted over Gaul. Constantius wasn't yet prepared to make any kind of permanent deal, though. First, he requested that Atolf return Galla Placidia, who had now been held captive for three years, and when Atolf hesitated, Constantius cut off that grain. So, war again. The Visigoths attacked Marseille unsuccessfully, but they were able to take Bordeaux, Toulouse, and Narbonne. Atolf was in full revolt now, and once again proclaimed Priscus Attalus as his new emperor. Even more provocatively, though, in 414, he married Galla Placidia. She apparently was perfectly willing, and soon after gave birth to a son, who sadly died only shortly thereafter. Orosius, the historian, frames the marriage as an earnest effort toward peace on Atoll's part. The ceremony was carried out in a Roman house with a Roman ceremony, with the traditional Gothic songs only coming at the end. Orosius related a summary of Atoll's speech at the wedding, which Orosius apparently heard later from someone who had been present. Quote, this is Orosius speaking. At first he, Atoll, was ardently eager to blot out the Roman name and make the entire Roman Empire that of the Goths alone, and to call it and make it Gothia instead of Romania, and that he become what Caesar Augustus had once been. When, however, he discovered from long experience that the Goths, by reason of their unbridled barbarism, could not by any means obey laws, he chose to seek for himself the glory of completely restoring and increasing the Roman name and for this reason he strove to refrain from war, especially by the influence and persuasion of his wife Placidia, a woman of very keen mind and good religiosity. It's hard to know what to make of that quote, if anything. It comes to us third-hand, which is like writing a history of the Cuban Missile Crisis based on something Marilyn Monroe's hairstylist said once. Some have interpreted it as a statement of Gothic policy, which seems far-fetched to me. Historian Guy Halsell suggests that if Atolf did say it, he might have been joking. I find that hard to believe, since everyone knows that it was Generation X that invented irony. In my mind, it seems that if Atolf said anything like it, he may have intended that sentiment to get back to Ravenna, to convey his willingness to work with the Emperor if the deal was right. If Honorius heard any of it, he was unimpressed. Constantius kept up the pressure. He blockaded Narbonne, and the Visigoths were forced to abandon their holdings, though they did take the time to sack the cities under their control before they moved south into Spain. Atolf attacked and captured Barcelona, but the old blood feud reappeared to strike him down. An old servant of Sarus, appropriately named Dubius, 
took his revenge and assassinated Atoff while he was bathing. That's one version of the story, and it's the one I'm going with, because the new king of the Visigoths was Cerus's brother, Sigurik, who seems to have been a piece of work. His short reign was a bloodbath, as Atolf and Alaric's supporters and family were purged, including six of Atolf's children by a previous marriage. Placidia was spared, but forced to walk twelve miles amongst the other captives ahead of the new king. The terror didn't last long, though, as Sigurik was murdered just seven days after taking the throne. Replacing him was a new king named Valia, who has a nice, easily remembered name. He was a relative of Alaric and Atolf, though the nature of that relationship isn't certain. Valia started his reign under deeply unfavorable conditions. He was bottled up in Barcelona. Starvation was setting in. The Vandals, who were in control of the surrounding country, sold the Visigoths grain at outrageous prices. One solidus, that's a gold piece, per spoonful, and gave them the mocking nickname Truly, which means roughly spoonies, from Trula, Latin for spoon. One group of Goths tried to make a break for it and escape by sea to Africa, but continuing the Gothic tradition of being hopeless with boats, they were caught in a storm and drowned. Valia found his way out of the trap, though, by finally reaching an agreement with Constantius and Honorius. Galla Placidia was returned to Italy, where Honorius forced her to marry Constantius, very much against her will this time, and Valia committed to helping the Romans regain control of Hispania from the Vandals and their partners. Once that was done, the Visigoths would be settled in Aquitania, the lands in southern Gaul from which they had been so recently forced out. The deal was a good one for both sides, but it did leave Priscus Attalus high and dry. He attempted to slip away, but was captured by Constantius's men and sent back to Italy. It could have gone a lot worse for him, though. As a usurper and a tool of barbarians, he was probably expecting to be executed horribly. Instead, he lost one hand and was sentenced to exile on the Aeolian Islands off the north coast of Sicily, where he lived out the rest of his days. There had been so many opportunities along the way for Alaric or Atolf to dump him, I can't help but think that he must have had some kind of charm about him. Wally and the Visigoths took on the job of fighting the Vandals with gusto. Besides the most recent humiliations, I'll show you who's a spoony, the two peoples had been rivals for generations. Remember, it was the Vandals who the Goths had pushed out as they spread south toward the steppes. The Vandals had lost out to the Goths in the contest for Dacia Triana after the Empire withdrew. They had fought on either side of civil wars as Federate troops and together just as frequently. The two peoples had been neighbors for almost all of their history, and it is with our closest neighbors that we develop our fiercest rivalries. But wait, I hear you blurt out, slamming down the pencil you've been using to take comprehensive notes. You just said that the Goths were starving in Barcelona, and now they're taking the fight to the Vandals with gusto? How's that possible? Where's the turnaround? The answer, of course, is simple. Supplies. The blockade that was the cause of the Goths' misery was lifted, and Roman ships instead began bringing food and provisions and weapons to them. The Italians could no longer raise armies that were big or well-trained enough to counter the barbarians that had flooded across the Rhine, but the Visigoths were an established unit, hardened by a generation of desperation, and the Romans could afford to get them what they needed. Most of it, anyway. The wars in Spain are what historians call poorly attested. The most thorough source, the Chronicle of Hydatius, was written 50 years after the fact, and is idiosyncratic in its reporting. The main source I've referenced for this episode up to this point, Orosius, comes to an end as the Visigoths begin their wars against the Vandals, saying that Wallia faced danger to himself by fighting against the other tribes that had settled throughout the Spains and conquered them for the Romans, which is slightly confusing in the syntax department. So, how it was accomplished exactly is not entirely clear, but Visigothic victory was swift and surprising. Properly supplied, they pushed the Vandals south out of the provinces of Baetica and Lusitania, while the Alans and Suevi were pushed west into Galicia. There may have been a plan for a final strike, but by 418 or 19, Constantius seems to have decided the situation was stable enough for him to recall the Visigoths and go ahead and settle them in Aquitania. Valia did not live to see the fulfillment of his clan's long-standing goal. He died in 418. I could not find exactly how. Valia was probably in his mid-thirties. He had been king of the Visigoths for around three years, and in that short time had earned a deserved reputation as a fierce fighter and a wise ruler. 
Qualia had no sons, though as we've seen, primogenitor succession is not necessarily the norm. He was succeeded instead by another member of the Baltai clan, Theodoric I. Theodoric was around 25 or 28 years old, and may have been an illegitimate son or grandson of Alaric, or possibly his son-in-law. Either way, it fell to him to oversee the Visigoths' settlement in their new Gallic lands. In our movie, he's played by Carl Urban, for a very specific reason, which should become clear later. The sources differ about which lands these actually were. That's probably overstating it. There's broad agreement that the territory in question was Second Aquitania, with the differences being the exact borders that the agreement specified. The modern consensus is that the Visigoths were given lands to farm along the Garonne Valley, including Toulouse and Bordeaux, and up and down the Atlantic coast from the Pyrenees to the mouth of the Loire. It's a pretty big chunk of land, but notably absent from it is any Mediterranean port. My interpretation of that decision is that Constantius wanted to make sure that he had a monopoly on outside support for the Visigoths. The provincial officials of southern Gaul were summoned to a council at Arles, and the settlement agreement presented to them. They approved it. Constantius wanted it made clear that the Roman state was allowing the Visigoths to settle on Roman lands. In no sense was it giving lands away to a barbarian kingdom. It may not have been intended to be permanent. Before I move along to talk about Theodoric and the events that followed the settlement, I want to pause and think about how the Visigoths have changed. It had been 40 years since the Battle of Adrianople, 40 years in the wilderness, which had changed them as a people, just as it had the Hebrews. Their name had changed. From a tribal society of dispersed authority, they were now a highly militarized nation on the move. They were much more organized, as they had to be, in order to stay together for all this time. Their leader now combined the roles of military leader, administrator, and dispenser of justice. He was, in short, becoming a medieval king. The Visigoths fought differently now, too. Remember, way back in episode 1, I noted with some surprise that the Tervingi fought as heavy infantry. Since they had crossed the Danube, they had mingled with their Typhali companions, been joined up with and then separated from Grathungi fighters, and of course been up close and personal with Hunnic horse archers. Well, not actually that close, that's the whole point of a horse archer, but you know what I mean. So now, as they set about making a new life in the south of France, the Visigoths were a cavalry force. The primary weapon now was the long lance, which I barely even mentioned back when we did weaponry before. The lance was used underhand, overhand, or two-handed to bring the point down on an unfortunate foot soldier, or couched, the way you imagine a classic knight in shining armor would. The elite Gothic fighter would have worn a male shirt that hung to his knees, and the very wealthy may have added a few bits of lamellar armor over that. Helmets were mostly of a Roman pattern, but you shouldn't imagine the legionary helmet from, like, Spartacus, with the horizontal brow ridge and the huge cheek flaps. By the 5th century, that pattern had long been replaced by what's called the late Roman ridge helmet. A high, round dome with a heavy reinforced central ridge was the center. The cheek flaps were still there, and an aventail of mail or articulated plates to guard the back of the neck with a nose guard now standard. The army so equipped was probably smaller than it had been when Alaric had waited in Tuscany with his 40,000 men. Since then, it had endured eight years of constant fighting, long marches, sieges, starvation, and two naval blockades. Numbers are hard to come by, as always, but the Visigoths' fighting force may have been as small as 10,000. But they were certainly tested and hardened. When I go around framing all of this in terms of 40 years of mosaic wandering in the wilderness, which is an idea I stole from our old friend Herwig Volk from, by the way, I'm imposing a narrative on the story. Anyone who tries to tell a historical story does this, except the most academic of academics. But no one in 418 could know that the agreement between Constantius, Theodoric, and the council at Arles, which may not even have been intended to be permanent, was actually the seed of an independent kingdom. Spoilers, though, that's what it was. The settlement with the Goths was part of wider successes in the West for the Roman state. As he was wrapping up his history, Orosius challenged his readers to find, quote, any times more fortunate, end quote, than those that he was living in. Constantius had worked wonders, and though the task was far from finished, it seemed that order was on its way to being restored in the West. 
As a reward, Constantius was elevated to co-emperor with Honorius in 421. He didn't get to enjoy the purple for very long, though, dying just eight months later. Without a strong hand guiding strategy, things quickly began to unravel. Again. The Goths were deployed to Spain in a renewed campaign against the Vandals, but the expedition ended disastrously, thanks to the ego of the Roman general and overall command. He sought the glory of an open battle over the assured success of a well-laid siege, and ended up getting neither. The defeat was blamed by some on the treachery of the Visigoths, because the old excuses die hard. I wonder sometimes how many people listening to these kind of things actually believe them. It doesn't matter, the campaign wasn't a success, but the Goths were engaged in actions against the Vandals to the south, and rebels to the north, as they were needed. Occasionally the need arose to ask for new concessions from Rome, and occasionally that led to Theodoric leading his army to threaten a city, usually Arles, sometimes Narbonne, until an agreement could be reached. Honorius died in 423, after an amazing 30 years spent mostly just filling out his robes and filling, feeding his chickens. He had no direct heirs, the nearest being his nephew Valentinian, who was the son of Constantius and Galla Placidia. The boy was just four years old at the time, and court intrigues forced him and his mother to flee to Constantinople. Those attacks by the Goths on Roman cities usually happened when court intrigues offered an opportunity for them to have a greater say in the way the empire was run. They took place in 426 and again around 433. In the second attack, though, they came up against a new nemesis by the name of Aetius. I'm not going to go through the crazy web of plotting and shifting loyalties that made Aetius the new most powerful man in the Western Empire. First, because I don't feel like I have room for it, Second, because this series is supposed to be focused on the Goths. And third, he's going to keep coming up again and again in future episodes. And I'm hoping that much of the story will come out as it touches on the others. For now, what you need to know about Aetius is that he was brilliant and, like Stilicho, ruthless and completely assured of his own abilities. Also, he had been a hostage of the Goths early in his life, and then a hostage of the Huns after that. So he had contacts among the tribes and he understood how barbarians operated. We need to cast him for the movie, and it has to be good. You know what? Michael Keaton. Like Batman-era Michael Keaton. Aetius was probably taller, but yeah, that'll work. Before you get too fond of him off of that, though, I will point out that he is responsible for one of the great war crimes of the ancient world. Aetius was absolutely committed to regaining solid, unquestioned control over Gaul. All of it. He started with the Rhine frontier and attacked the Burgundian kingdom that had been allowed to grow up there. He beat them in 436 and then was back in 437, bringing with him several thousand Hunnic auxiliaries. For reasons that have vanished into the stream of time, Aetius's Huns attacked the already beaten Burgundians and slaughtered them. A huge portion of the tribe was killed, many thousands of people, maybe as many as 20,000. The incident was absorbed into legend, and forms the center of the great German saga, the Nibelungenlied. Forgive the digression. I just wanted to, to be clear who we're dealing with here. Having taken care of the Burgundians, Aetius turned to Theodoric's Visigoths. There would be no messing around with Aetius. He defeated the Goths and then turned north, leaving a subordinate to handle mop-up operations. But that commander was captured and killed at Toulouse, and then simultaneously the Vandals took Carthage. I'm sorry, what? Well, where did you think that the Vandals had gone when they were driven out of Spain? The Vandals will get their own episode soon, but the fall of Carthage may have been the most important development in the disintegration of the Western Empire. In the short term, it meant that Aetius had to make peace with Theodoric. In order to have any hope of raising a force big enough to contend with the Vandals, Aetius had to extract himself from Gaul by any means necessary which ultimately meant that much of what he had achieved was lost. Spain was back in chaos, Britain had been gone for a generation now, and northern Gaul was restive and subject to Saxon and Frankish raiding. Theodoric may not have been the most reliable partner, but by making a deal there, Aetius could at least plug one hole in the dike. That deal was of tremendous importance for the Goths, because it was the first time the Romans recognized them as an equal force. They acknowledged Theodoric as a king, 
and the Gothic kingdom as a sovereign entity within Rome's borders, rather than a federated tribe. I'm now imagining Carl Urban as the Shining King riding across the fields of southern France, golden hair streaming in the wind. Should be pretty easy to picture, just queue up Lord of the Rings. The armor is more Anglo-Saxon, but the spirit of the Goths is there in the writers of Rohan. The result of that agreement was nearly ten years of relative peace for the Visigoths, providing troops to fight in Spain as needed, but also conducting their own separate foreign policy, making political marriages with other barbarian groups, including the Vandals. They were gradually putting down roots, and the elite Visigoths were beginning to become part of the aristocratic class of Gaul. Not barbarian aristocrats, just aristocrats. Aetius ran around, wheeling and dealing, putting out fires wherever they sprang up. He was unable to retake Africa, and Spain was in a shambles, in spite of Visigothic help. But he had more success along the Rhine frontier and in the northern parts of Gaul. Overall, he pursued a policy of government by punitive expedition, and seems to have been keeping his head above water. And then Attila came. The Huns are going to get episodes to themselves, so we'll talk all about the reasons behind Attila's invasion of 451 then. But it was a crisis for the Romans and for every other people caught in the Huns' path. City after city fell to the Huns and was sacked, finding their way into legends of saints who saved them or martyrs who were lost. Worms, Mainz, Chams, sacked. Paris may have been threatened. The Huns were held up, laying siege to Orléans, and that gave Aetius critical time to muster his own forces and call upon every friend, ally, and frenemy he could, including Theodoric. Gondor called for aid, and Rohan would answer. Having pieced together his force from anywhere he could get them, Aetius moved to challenge the so far unbeatable Attila. He and Theodoric set out from Toulouse and marched toward Orléans. Attila was moving east already, loaded with plunder and feeling that he had done enough for one year's campaigning. Attila learned of the pursuing forces and sent delaying parties to skirmish with them and give the Huns time to get out of Gaul. Not that he was afraid, you understand. It just would be a shame to lose any of all this treasure in the fight. Jordanes, being Jordanes, says that 15,000 men were killed in one of these skirmishes, which is just ridiculous. But it gives you an idea of the epic scale of the battle in the minds of the people who reported it afterwards. Aetius, Theodoric, and their army caught up with Attila at a place that has several names. Sometimes the battle that's about to take place is called the Battle of Chalon. Sometimes it's the Battle of the Campus Moriacus, or the Battle of Troyes. Most commonly in English, it's named the Battle of the Catalonian Fields. The exact location of the battlefield is unknown, but it was probably somewhere between Chalon and Troyes, in the Champagne region. Having had ample warning, both sides took their time setting up their order of battle. Jordanius says that they were arrayed on either side of a steep hill. That makes very little tactical sense, and even less geographic sense, as Champagne is in pretty darn flat. The usual interpretation is that the two armies were on either side of a long ridge. Aetius was in command of the Roman left, Theodoric and his men were on the right. On the other side, Attila was surrounded by leaders of all the tribes that he and his predecessors had subjugated, most significantly the Ostrogoths. The Amali clan, remember, way back, trapped behind the Danube and subjugated by the Huns, now faced off across the fields against their cousins. Generations had passed since the two groups had separated, and times had been tough for both of them. The Ostrogoths appeared to have been set on the Hunnic left, directly opposite Theodoric and the Visigoths. The initial action was a struggle for position and control of the ridge. Aetius and his men pushed the Huns back on their side of the line, and for a moment it looked like it would be a quick engagement, but Attila shouted his encouragement and possibly threats, and rallied his army into a general charge. The battle then began in earnest. I'm going to let Jordanes take it from here. Warning, though, graphic content ahead. Quote, Hand to hand they clashed in battle, and the fight grew fierce, confused, monstrous, unrelenting, a fight whose like no ancient time has ever recorded. There such deeds were done that a brave man who missed the spectacle could not hope to see anything so wonderful all his life long. 
A brook flowing between low banks through the plain was greatly increased by blood from the wounds of the slain. Those whose wounds drove them to slake their thirst drank water mingled with roar. End quote. Ew. The Visigoths flew across the plain fighting bravely and fell upon the Huns, nearly reaching Attila himself. He and his bodyguards withdrew to their fortified camp. Darkness brought an end to the battle before any real conclusion was reached, and there was apparently a great deal of riding around in the dark. Theodoric's oldest son, Thorismund, stumbled onto the Huns' baggage train, thinking it was his own, and was dragged from his horse and nearly killed before he was rescued by some of his men. Aetius likewise became separated from the main body of the armies, and had a hair-raising few hours before he found his way back to his own camp. In the morning, the dead were piled high on the field. The Huns remained in their camp, and there was some debate about what to do next. In this lull, the body of Theodoric was found, quote, where the dead lay thickest, as happens with brave men, end quote. Some said he had been thrown by his horse and trampled, others that he had died by the spear of one Andag of the Ostrogoths. The Visigoths buried him there on the plain, and mourned their king. Jordanes again, quote, Tears were shed, but such as they were accustomed to devote to brave men. It was death indeed, but the Huns are witness that it was a glorious one. It was a death whereby one might suppose the pride of the enemy would be lowered when they beheld the body of so great a king, borne forth with fitting honors. End quote. After he had buried his father, Aetius advised Thor's men to take his men home and secure his succession. Thorismund had several brothers, and apparently thought there might be a possibility that his inheritance was in danger. He took Aetius' advice and took his army back to Toulouse. There he was proclaimed the new king of the Visigoths with great joy and no resistance whatsoever. Jordanes suggested that Aetius was playing games, that he allowed the Huns to slip away after the battle, which they did, because the threat of their return would ensure the Visigoths would not seek independence. It also meant there were fewer men around who might want to share the spoils of the battle. Jordanes reported that 165,000 were killed at the Battle of the Catalonian Fields, which is just absurd. Scholarly opinion about this and just about every other aspect of the battle, including who won it, is divided. Piecing together bits and bobs of information and estimates and guesstimates and extrapolations, suggests that perhaps a hundred thousand fighting men may have taken part. But historians can't even agree on how important the battle actually was in the long run, so what are we going to do? What is indisputable, though, is the importance of the battle in the legends and self-image of the Goths and later Germans. It has been noted that sources close to the event frame it as Aetius' victory, while as time went on it was seen more and more as a victory for Theodoric, Thorismund, and the Gothic people. In one legend, the fighting was so fierce that the souls of the slain could be seen still fighting as they rose up toward the heavens. Theodoric's legend came all the way down to modern popular culture, as he is at least one of the sources for J.R.R. Tolkien's Theoden of Rohan, who died fighting the forces of evil on the Pelennor fields. Theodoric's death nicely bookends this section on the Goths. His sacrifice mirrors that of Erminaric nearly a century before. I am aware that I'm engaging in hideous romanticism and ahistorical sentimentality, but the Catalonian field seemed to me, at least in literature, as a cathartic purging of the poison of those earlier defeats. And really, a touch of the romantic is one of the reasons that the period is so attractive in the first place. This episode is the last one that will focus on the Goths. I had intended to do it in four, but turns out I needed five. I am not going to make predictions about how long the next series will be, since it'll probably be wrong. We're going to rewind the clock and pull another thread out of the skein of history to look at things from a new angle. So next time, we'll start our new series on the hunt. That episode will probably end up having to wait for about two weeks, since life has gotten a bit busy around here, and I'm not sure I'll be able to find time to put it together. Thank you so much for listening. I love seeing new downloads appear on the little counter thing, and would love even more your feedback on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. A belated welcome going out to my listeners overseas. Very happy to see you guys popping up and making the map more colorful. As always, check out the website, 
darkagespodcast.podbean.com. I'm not sure exactly what I'll be posting there for this episode, but I have a few ideas and I'll put links in the show notes as appropriate. Twitter is still a thing, I guess, if you'd like your feedback to get to me more directly, at Dark Ages Pod, and the Dark Ages Podcast Facebook group. Just search Dark Ages Podcast and that'll get you there. Okay, I think that's everything. Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.